All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the F Word Programming in Fortran. Happy Earth Day to you. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about um, a bit of a long-term project. Uh, we're, I'm basically stepping in towards the direction of implementing a uh, 3D compressible fluid solver to model seawater. Uh, so today is just the very beginning of this, so we'll be giving a bit of an outline on uh, some of the motivation here and some of the things we're taking into consideration during the development process. Now, after the blackboarding session, I'll dive into uh, coding up a 2D compressible Euler solver to get us on track uh, for getting this all implemented, but we're going to do this in an incremental approach uh, so we can keep this manageable and fun to work with. Let's first acknowledge our references. Of course, since tomorrow is National Reading Day, this should give you a good deal of stuff if you're interested in following along with what I'm doing here. Um, there's a handful of papers uh, from G Journal of Physical Oceanography that talks a lot about uh, some of the issues um, with Boussinesque uh, systems uh, for, for simulating the oceans, particularly around some of the errors that you can incur if you don't take into account uh, compressibility in the oceans when you're calculating deep geostrophic velocities. Uh, of course, we're going to be tying this in with some of the things we've been talking about for the last few episodes on spectral element methods in general and how to do stable or provably stable conservation laws for fluids modeling. Previously, we had looked at doing uh, shallow water equations in the last uh, two or three episodes. We talked a little bit about uh, uh, satisfying the metric identities so that we can guarantee free stream preservation. Uh, and a lot of that work culminates in this paper from Andrew Winters in 2021, uh, where they talk about how to apply a lot of those same methodologies, you know, starting from a skew-symmetric form, et cetera, um, of the equations we're modeling to um, basically create a, a stable, compressible Navier-Stokes solver. So that's where I'm pulling a lot of my information from for today and a lot of the work we got coming up in the future. And let's go ahead and get started. So let's talk about what the compressible Euler equation, uh, what the compressible Euler equations are, what they look like. And remember, you know, every time I do one of these uh, live streams where we develop a method, when we're working with the spectral element libraries in Fortran, our goal is to try to cast the equation we're uh, trying to solve is in terms of this very generic looking uh, conservation law where we have the time rate of change of a vector of prognostic variables, we uh, that the, that time rate of change is dictated by the divergence of a conservative flux vector, and then some additional source terms. Now you remember the usual things we do is we basically map these equations uh, into a computational space so we can change them around very uh, slightly. When we do that sort of mapping, what ends up happening is we have the Jacobian weighted solution vector uh, with it, which as long as the mesh isn't moving with time which here we're going to assume it's not we have a time derivative of the Jacobian weighted solution vector so the Jacobian of the coordinate transformation plus the divergence in computational space of the uh, contravariant weighted flux vector so I'll use that tilde over top to indicate that we're basically doing a projection uh, onto contravariant basis vectors and on the right hand side we have a Jacobian weighted source term. Okay. Now, in self and in this kind of framework, our job when we're developing an algorithm uh, to, to use the spectral element libraries in Fortran is to identify uh, the prognostic variables, the conservative flux, and the source term. Now, for compressible Navier-Stokes, I'm just going to pull up some notes here so I make sure I get all of this right. Um, the compressible Navier-Stokes, what we're really looking at modeling is the, the fluid density, the momentum vector, so the, the basically the density multiplied by the velocity vector. Then we have a total internal energy. And for seawater, what we're going to do is, is kind of glob together all the different uh, salt ion species into one sort of species we'll just call salinity. Now, there's a lot of arguments on why we would do this. Um, I, I will be posting some notes after this video up on our Open Collective page. Uh, in case you're interested, but it walks through uh, why this is actually pretty reasonable to do for ocean modeling. But in essence, what this, what this translates to in terms of our prognostic variables 
Uh, like I said, we have a density. We have three components of velocity, so rho u, rho v, and rho w. We have a total internal energy, which we're going to use the density weighted total internal energy since the, we want the method to be starting in conservative form. And then we have a density weighted uh, salinity. Now, if we're just doing the Euler equations, the, the only things we have kind of messing with the uh, momentum is we're going to have advection of, of momentum, and then we'll have a pressure gradient force. Now, of course, in a geophysical setting or, you know, if you're doing ocean modeling, you usually want to include things like gravity, which we will eventually. Um, let's talk about this flux term here next. So if we were to, uh, to incorporate um, basically advection for the, uh, for the density term, advection for momentum, pressure gradient force, uh, etc., what we can do uh, for the flux term, again, we're going to do advection. So we have rho times u. The divergence of that is going to give us the time rate of change of the uh, density field. Uh, for, rho, for rho u, so the x component of the velocity field, what we're going to have is uh, rho u u plus, and then we have a pressure gradient in the x direction, so we'll have p x hat. For rho v, we'll have rho v u vector plus p in the y hat. For the vertical component, we have rho w u plus p in the z hat. Now for the internal energy, um, it's a little bit more complicated uh, because we have you have pressure work going on here that can that can raise or or, or uh, decrease the internal energy. Um, so this comes from like fluid convergences and divergences. Divergences you can also advect any existing energy around in the system. Uh, the way we usually handle this, at least the way I'm, I'm going to handle it here in, in the equations we're working with, is we're going to have uh, rho u times the dynamic enthalpy. I'll define that here in a second. And then for the salinity, we're, of course, just going to advect that around. Now, if we did want to include diffusive effects, uh, we certainly could do that. And this is pretty typical if you're doing LES modeling where you'll have some kind of closure scheme where you'll calculate a, a uh, what's usually called an eddy viscosity, um, and you'll plug this into a Laplacian type operator. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about that here in a minute, uh, but for now we're going to focus on the hyperbolic components of the system. So in other words, we just have advection and sound waves going on. Of course, now we have uh, effects from salinity uh, going on here. So let's define this dynamic enthalpy. So the enthalpy here really is the total energy. So this is the internal energy plus the kinetic energy. So the component that comes from the macro scale movement of the fluid. And then we have plus the pressure. Okay. Uh, for that source term. Now, of course, there can be sources and sinks of, of fluid mass. Here we're going to actually let those be zero for our problem. Now, in, in a very general context, what you might have uh, for the ocean is uh, you have precipitation and evaporation at the fluid surface. You might have contributions from ice melt, uh, various things like that that can be handled through boundary conditions or internal source terms. And it's a very lengthy discussion to get into how you actually implement those kinds of processes. But what we're focusing on right now is starting from scratch, just getting the dynamical core of the system up and running so we can provide that sort of layer for, for a physical oceanographer or a climate scientist to come in and, and make those kinds of injections into this code very easily. So we're going to leave that off for now. Now on the, um, on the, on the um, momentum equations, typically what we, what we work with um, when you're doing uh, geophysical modeling, or if you're doing like trying to simulate the, the ocean currents, is you'll have some representation of gravity in there. And, and normally gravity shows up as like if, if I had a, let's say this sphere uh, is, the, is the globe, right? And this very, very thin shell around that globe, we have our ocean surface, right? So you have water sitting on top of this solid rock and you have gravity pointing towards the center of that planet. Uh, and what you normally would do, you, you could do this a lot of ways, of course, but you could have gravity represented as the gravitational acceleration for Earth, so 9.8 meters per second squared, 
pointing in the uh, negative r hat direction, so it's pointing towards the center of the Earth. So if you or orient your coordinate system at the center of the Earth, this works fine. Of course, it also assumes that you're using a spherical coordinate system. So it kind of like making that decision really forces you into this. I'm only modeling things on a thin thin shelled sphere. We want to be a little bit more general than that. Instead, what we want to do is say someone's given me a 3D geometry they want to have and they give me what's called a potential field. Um, and if I take the gradient of that potential field, that should give me the direction of gravitational acceleration. So what we'll put in here is we have um, d phi dx in the x hat direction for the x momentum equation, d phi dy in the y hat direction for the, uh, the v equation, and then d phi dz in the z hat direction. Again, where phi is this potential forcing term that shows up, and typically we can, we can use something like this to define the direction that gravity is pointing. Okay. Uh, for the energy equation, um, we, we do, of course, there can be diffusive terms, and certainly if you want a stable, um, a provably stable method, there does need to be some kind of dissipation. Now, if we're at large scales and molecular uh, diffusion is not important, so large Reynolds number, those kinds of things, you know, using those kind of molecular scale viscosities and, and diffusivities doesn't really make sense because they hardly have a contribution on the balance of the, the, um, the various equations here. Again, you could have uh, some kind of, of LES closure scheme. Again, topics for another day. So what we're going to start with here is very simple. We have no dissipate, no explicit dissipation uh, of energy. Where our dissipation comes from in this method is really going to come from how we choose to implement the Riemann solver, which is it, again, it's a journey in itself. Uh, and then for salinity, we'll you you know again. This salinity really comes into play when you're talking about doing interactions with uh, the atmosphere. So again, evaporation, precipitation, uh, or with the cryosphere. So if you're uh, exchanging salinity or fresh water um, with uh, ice melt, glaciers, things like that, or if you have runoff from your land, uh, so injections from like rivers and estuaries, things like that. Again, these are all details for another day, so we're going to try to limit our attention so we can make some forward progress here. So again, we'll have zero on the right-hand side. Now, of course, if you're on a spinning planet, I guess I should have left this one in here. Um, we're not going to implement it today, but there are other terms to account for the fact that you're on a rotating planet. Um, so we would you know, add the Coriolis force uh, to, to this source term as well. But again, today we're not going to touch that. So this is the gist of the uh, system we're going to be working with. So it looks very similar to, um, you know, compressible Euler for an ideal gas, except that instead of having um, just the uh, density, momentum, total energy, we now have salinity. So of course, in atmospheric modeling, you'll typically have uh, humidity uh, or other trace gases that you're trying to, to, uh, to model. Now, the one thing I haven't pointed out here is that we've got one, two, three, four, five, six equations, but I have seven unknowns. The other unknown here is uh, this pressure. And how we calculate this pressure is incredibly important. Um, and, and the reason why I got into this particular problem was during grad school, um, I had been playing around with, with, with Taylor series on, on, a, on a basic equation, a state that would look like calc if you were to calculate pressure from uh, density. So if you knew your density field, if you knew your salinity field, and if you knew the internal energy, um, you can do some very, you know, some very simple analysis to show that um, the first order effects of, of the relationship between pressure and density end up scaling like one over the speed of sound squared. Um, which, since water is actually compressible, even though we have most of the flows in the ocean are incredibly low Mach number, um, there was this, actually, let me scroll back here. Uh, this paper from my uh, PhD advisor in 1997, they were looking at these kinds of like scaling problems, and if you were to account for the fact that the ocean is compressible, um, the errors that you incur from neglecting the compressibility of the ocean give you you know, ge geostrophic flows deep in the ocean that are order you know, centimeters per second. 
And this is kind of a problem because a lot of flows that deep are about <laughs> the order of centimeters per second. So it definitely suggested that we needed to find a way uh, to fix this problem. Since most ocean simulation codes uh, neglect compressibility, instead they have d rho dt is, is zero, and we have divergence of the velocity field is zero, and they use that as a way to calculate the pressure. And it ends up resulting in like an elliptic solver, which has some favor favorable computational properties. But of course, you're incurring this error in the process. Now, you have to commit some other sins in the Boussinesque equation to get this to work out so that you have an energetically stable system of equations. In other words, they're well posed. Um, in other words, in a finite amount of time, the total energy of the system cannot go unbounded. And um, it, it, it's really tricky when you're, when you're working with these uh, general circulation models uh, you know, how you actually handle doing this equation of state once you make an incompressibility approximation. And, and in my, my personal opinion, it, it, it really adds to the complexity of some of these, these models where you have to make some of these really bespoke decisions um, in how you're, you know, simulating the ocean. So we did, I did do a follow-up paper um, in grad school with my PhD advisor where we looked at, okay, well, um, on one hand, we, we know that the oceans are low Mach number, so it doesn't make sense to retain compressibility uh, in this sense. Um, because if you're using like an explicit time-stepping scheme, the time-step restrictions are incredibly small. Uh, so if you neglect it, you can start to take bigger time steps. So it, in terms of computational efficient, efficiency, there's some, some, some arguments to be made there. Um, but, but again, you know, the, the issue comes down to um, some of these errors that we incur. So, oh, so anyways, the point, the point being, uh, we, we came up with a modification of the Boussinesque equations that uh, provides an additional correction term that at least handles this, this first order effect and corrects those geostrophic velocities down deep. And it was energetically consistent. Uh, so we can, at, to some degree, come up with some remark on uh, stability of that system. However, again, there's some of these bespoke terms that end up coming in in terms of implementing it in a model. It's a little bit too complex for me. So I prefer to just say, you know what, let's just go fully compressible uh, and then let the time step method that we choose, ideally an implicit method that lets you select um, the, uh, the, the time step size uh, to, to dictate what kind of errors we're going to occur in the process. Okay. All that being said, We've got the compressible Euler equations, and uh, we know we'll have some kind of uh, equation of state that we're going to put there. So let's talk about the discretization. So what we'll do, and this is just an example of a top-down view um, of a, uh, a mesh for the East Coast of the United States, just as an example. Essentially, what we're going to do is divide a domain into hexahedra. So if you were to look down, these are, you know, you're seeing quadrilaterals, but you can imagine they're being extruded down towards the bottom. Um, so, you know, given whatever mesh generation choice we, we've made, uh, we have a mesh and we have hexahedra, right? And each of those elements, what we're going to do again is map from uh, physical, uh, phys physical space to computational space. So we can do calculations, um, uh, we can do <laughs> calculus operations in these sort of mapped coordinates, okay? So like I said before, once you do these mappings, you get a modified form of the equations that you need to solve in computational space. And we're also going to be looking at uh, what we do is we solve those equations in the weak form. So if I were, to, I'll bring that equation over, I'll use the S tilde to indic indicate the Jacobian weighted term. Okay, we got the divergence of F with the tilde, whoops, tilde, underbar, and we got Q tilde. What we do is over each element in the domain, so each one of these hexahedra, we're going to weight the solution by a test function. So st phi, divergence of f, and we have our source term. So we're going to weight each term with a test function. Okay, and then you integrate over each of those volumes. tv, dv. Then, what we're going to do is apply integration by parts once on the uh, flux divergence term. And what that gives us is an integral over each volume, phi dv, plus 
Uh, let's see here. So we'll have uh, f tilde dot grad in the computational space of the test function. Um, -da -da -da. Whoops, let me move that term. Sorry, so we'll have f tilde, so the, uh, the contravariant projection of that flux vector multiplied by the test function on the boundaries of that element. So we have a boundary integral uh, to take care of. So I'll say it's ds um, vector and dot. Then we got minus uh, f tilde dot grad test function dv. And on the right hand side again we have q phi dv. Now the next few assumptions, I'm gonna wave my hands through because I've done these a few times. If you haven't seen it before, you can check out any of the, the videos from this year uh, in this uh, playlist. Uh, and you'll, you'll get the gist of, of how this is done. I've also got a collaboratory that explains uh, those details and there's notes uh, from previous live streams you can all find at our Open Collective page. Uh, but essentially what we do is so right now the test function is any square integrable function and we're assuming that the solution the flux vector and the source term are square integrable functions all right so what we assume one is that phi is now just a polynomial of degree n it's not any test function that's square integral integrable it's polynomials of degree n and in fact we let phi be each of the lagrange interpolating polynomials so psi, lj, eta, and lk, uh, zeta. So if we have three computational coordinates, psi, eta, and zeta, uh, each of the test functions phi, i, j, k are the Lagrange interpolating polynomials of degree n. So this gives me my bases to work with. I let my um, solution flux vector and the source term also be polynomials the degree n and in fact they're interpolants so as an example of what i mean there i have the solution vector uh, is just going to be the sum i j k if i'm doing 3d from 0 to n so i'll keep the polynomial degree in each dimension uh, order n polynomials so i'll have the nodal values of the solution s i j k l i lj lk where again those li lj lk are the lagrange interpolating polynomials okay now when we substitute these these two approximations into the weak form we now have integrals that involve polynomials and we can then use uh, gauss like quadrature uh, to evaluate those integrals exactly and so what we do is, as a third assumption here, is we're going to replace these uh, continuous integration. We're going to replace the continuous integration with discrete Gauss quadrature. And we're going to co-locate the interpolation knots, so the points where uh, those Lagrange interpolating polynomials pass through, we're going to replace those with the same Gauss quadrature that we're using to evaluate that integral. Okay. So all that being said, uh, we end up with, for each element, a system of equations. And then we have on the boundary, uh, we have a little bit of a problem to deal with. Uh, this is the Riemann problem. And again, if you've watched these videos before, you've seen this kind of thing happen. Uh, essentially, what we have is on the boundary of the elements, we have uh, an internal state, which here I'm calling S left and an external state I'm calling S right. And what I designate as internal and external is it's with respect to the element that I'm actually looking at. So if this were my primary element, the boundary normal is always outward pointing and that dictates which one is internal and external. What we're gonna do to, to solve this problem, if you remember, I'll do a little bit of a refresher here. What we have is a problem and I'll just sketch this out in 1D just as a refresher, where we have a conservation law that might look like this. At ds dt plus df dx is zero. We can also write this in what's called advective form. So we can do chain rule on that flux. So we get df ds ds dx equals zero, right? And then from here, we know that the solution to this problem is whatever the initial condition is, 
x minus df ds t. Right, so if I know what the solution is at a given time, I can calculate how this evolves over time. Now, of course, this is only for linear systems. It gets more complicated with nonlinear systems, but you can essentially, one approach is to linearize the equations. And once you linearize the equations off of, say, an initial condition, you can come up with something that looks like dfds evaluated at s0 uh, multiplied by time and get an estimate of that Riemann solver. There's a, lots of there's a lot of theory that goes into designing these kinds of solvers. Today we're going to do some, oh right, let me, I'll sketch out real quick the, the system. So if, I, if these were vectors, right, dfds then is a matrix and it doesn't end up being this simple, but if dfds is a matrix, so we'll call it A, you can diagonalize that for hyperbolic systems. So if you find its eigenvalues and its eigenvectors, you can write that matrix as PDP inverse. And if you multiply the whole equation by P inverse and you make some assumptions about uh, this being constant in time, what you can end up with is, so we have a DS DT, it's PDP inverse, DS DX. Again, these are vectors. Okay, I multiply the left-hand side, the, uh, multiply on the left side by P inverse. I get P inverse S. Again, if I make some assumptions about um, the eigenvector staying constant in time, I can do little things like this, where I can bring P inverse into the time derivative. I can bring P inverse into the X derivative, right? Of course, I'm incurring some errors here for nonlinear problems. Um, but now you have what are called characteristic variables, so things that are stay constant along characteristics for your hyperbolic system, um, but you now have a decoupled system. So I have wt plus d wx is zero, where d is diagonal, so each of these characteristic variables are linearly independent, uh, and then you can get for each uh, w, wi not x minus lambda i, T, where lambda i is those eigenvectors. So this gives us a way to look at a problem uh, in terms of, of, of basically, so if, if you apply this to a situation where you have a jump discontinuity in your solution across an element face like we do with DG methods, uh, we can reconstruct a Riemann solver doing things like this. Um, there's a lot of different Riemann solvers out there. A lot of them are carefully designed uh, to have good properties in terms of, you know, actually being dissipative. Some of them are designed to make sure that the variation, the total variation in your solution, so the amount of oscillations you have, uh, is limited uh, or diminishing. Uh, there's lots, lots of, lots of theory that goes into that. We're going to do something simple for today to get things started. We're going to do what's called a local Lax Friedrichs Riemann solver. In a couple videos prior, when we talked about the nonlinear shallow water equations, I provided a reference there. Um, it's a book from the 90s, absolutely fantastic on, on how to solve conservation laws, and they really delve into uh, Riemann solvers quite heavily. But today we're going to do local Lax Friedrichs, and essentially what we're going to do here is the Riemann flux is going to be the average of the flux from the left side and the flux from the right side minus the max eigenvalue on two times the jump in the solution. Okay, that's the local lax friedrichs riemann solver. So what it reduces our problem down to in terms of, in terms of getting the, um, uh, the Riemann solver implemented is determining what that max eigenvalue looks like. Now for the compressible Navier-Stokes or compressible Euler equations, uh, max lambda is going to be the max of the following. We have u dot n hat, so the normal component of the velocity plus the speed of sound uh, evaluated on the left side u on the left side dotted with the normal vector minus the speed of sound, u on the right side dotted with the normal vector plus the speed of sound on the right side, and u 
dotted with the normal minus speed of sound. So that's how we're going to calculate um, that maximum eigenvalue. Um, there's a lot of theory that goes into this. Again, when I post the notes tonight, there's a, there's a section in those notes on the compressible oiler for seawater. Um, I'll show you where all this comes from. But again, I gave you the gist of it. The deal is you're looking at uh, diagonalizing a linearization of the compressible Navier-Stokes and pulling out the eigenvalues from that from that uh, matrix. So that's the local lax free extreme on solver. So let's let's kind of recap here so far where we've gotten. So we're solving a conservation law. Okay, our prognostic variables are density, momentum, total energy, and salinity. Density weighted. Everything's density weighted because we want it in conservative form. The fluxes are uh, we have an advective flux for density. We have advective fluxes for momentum and the pressure gradient force. Those are all in there. We've got uh, advection of dynamic enthalpy that changes our total energy. And then we've got uh, advection of density weighted salinity uh, that moves salinity around. Not putting in any source terms for salinity or total energy, nor for the density, but we do have potential momentum sources coming from uh, uh, potential fields, things that could give us things like uh, gravity forces uh, due to gravity. Um, like I said, we can do Coriolis force. I'm not going to be implementing that today. Okay. And uh, so once we had that system, of course, we're going to basically discretize our domain into hexahedra. Okay. And the hexahedra are going to get mapped from uh, physical to computational space. We're going to map the conservation law accordingly, look at the weak form, and then reduce our space of functions that we're considering as solutions to polynomials a degree n. We replace the solution flux and source terms with interpolants of polynomial degree n. Uh, same thing with the metric terms, things like that. And we end up with a, a discrete system for each element. To close the system, we need to couple elements with this Riemann solver. So that's the gist of it. Uh, I did mention in the beginning, there's this issue. We have six equations, yet we have seven unknowns. That seventh unknown is the pressure. Um, so we need to calculate, we need a, an equation of state for the seawater. Now, typically in ocean modeling, what we do, for, since we're usually using the Boussinesq equations in ocean model, modeling, uh, is you'll have the density, or the what's called the potential density, but here I'll write down the in situ density. We diagnose the density from salinity, potential temperature, and usually some kind of background pressure field. We don't use a dynamic pressure field. Um, but nonetheless, those equations of state are posed in this way. The problem is in the compressible term, uh, in the compressible Euler equations, we're given density, we're given salinity, and we're given total energy. And we need to actually back out uh, a pressure from that. So this is what we typically do, right? This is the Boussinesq way of diagnosing or, or closing the system. And in compressible form, what we have as uh, independent variables are uh, salinity, energy. We can say internal energy. Just remove the kinetic energy component from that. And, uh, we, oops, not pressure. We've got uh, density, right? So salinity, energy, and uh, density. And we want to back out a pressure from that. So there's already a problem that we need to solve at some point of fitting. So essentially, these come in uh, as tables from oceanographic measurements. Uh, they're polynomial fits to data. Um, so essentially, at some point, we need to recreate these tables to cast a polynomial fit uh, from this form uh, to this form. So this is a problem for another day. Now, the simplest thing we can do to get ourselves started, at the very least, is look at a linearization about a specific point. Because at the very least, this can help us prove concept a little bit. And uh, of course, the, the other thing that I, I should back up here just for a second before I go to too far is <laughs> most of the time we, we insert a, 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 this what's called a potential temperature. So it's the t temperature that a fluid parcel would have if you move that parcel adiabatically um, to some reference height. It's a very bizarre thing that oceanographers do. Um, 
But uh, anyways, we have that as our thermodynamic temperature variable. And for our compressible system, what we really have is internal energy. So there's a little bit of not just, of course, it's not just fitting tables, but we need to have some way of relating the salinity energy density relationship to potential temperature. Uh, and these are the tables. So there's, there's a bit of work to, to be done there. We're going to start simple. Um, so if I look at, if I have a, a some reference salinity, reference energy, uh, reference density, I can get a reference pressure. So again, this is, uh, I'll, I'll fill that in actually. So P naught is the equation of state evaluated at some reference salinity, reference energy, reference density. Okay. And then if you do Taylor series, right, we can do DPDS um, S minus S naught. We have D uh, P D energy. E minus E naught plus dPd rho. So change in pressure with density multiplied by a linear change in the density, right? And then of course you have higher order terms. So hot, higher order terms. What we can do today is at least put in something that we can evaluate of this form and leave these parameters. So P naught, dPdS, dPdE, PD rho, so these are evaluated at our reference, um, S naught, E naught, rho naught, so these are fixed values. Um, we can look at doing this kind of a linear equation of state to start. Uh, it's a very sim fairly simple place to start, and at least at some point what I'll do after we get through some of the initial implementation today is look these up in some engineering tables, um, see what we can plug in. Uh, so that's that on the equation of state. And now we have an implementation issue that we need to think about long term. So our, what I'm calling prognostic variables are the things that appear in the time derivative term of our system. So we have prognostic, our density, momentum. Uh, what do we have? Uh, <laughs> density weighted energy and we have density weighted salinity. Okay, those are our prognostic variables. Diagnostic variables, so things, things that we can calculate based on the prognostic variables. We have pressure, of course, this is from our equation of state. Now, oceanographers don't, don't typically work with total energy. You tell them a value for total energy, it's not going to be as meaningful as something like uh, internal, uh, well, certainly I don't know about internal energy either, but it's not going to be as meaningful as something like in situ temperature or potential temperature. So at some point we need to have a way to calculate potential temperature. Okay. We ha need to have a way to calculate in situ temperature. And of course there's lots of other variables we might want to track. So kinetic energy, um, and of course our, our total energy E, which is not going to be the same as our, um, uh, it's going to be our mathematical entropy function that we use to track stability for that system. But I'm going to go ahead and, and call that guy, um, don't want to call it eta because we also have to deal with free surface height at some point, and that's a eta is usually reserved for free surface height. Um, but at some point, we'll also have to deal with uh, an entropy function, so I'll call it epsilon. This is our mathematical entropy, and that has yet to be defined. Now that paper from Andrew Winters in 2021 provided a, a mathematical entropy function for um, the compressible Euler equations when you're modeling an ideal gas. Here now we have an additional salinity variable, so we need to make modifications to that to define mathematical entropy. Now, in addition to this being an issue, if you want an oceanographer or a climate scientist to actually provide initial conditions and you don't want to make it hard for them, we ought to speak this language over here in terms of pressure, uh, potential temperature or in situ temperature, 
and uh, salinity. So if someone wants to provide us initial and boundary conditions in terms of these kinds of variables, we need to have a way to translate between these sorts of specifications. So if someone wanted to give me a potential temperature and a pressure and a salinity and a velocity field, I need to be able to back out initial conditions uh, in terms of uh, rho, momentum, total energy, and salinity, right? So we need to have a way to map between these. So there's, there's definitely a lot more complication going on than just implementing the prognostic variables, the flux terms, the source terms. We're going to do that today to start, but this is where it's going to ultimately land us, is to a point where we could start creating these kinds of tools that make this model functional for an oceanographer. We have to speak their language, but we know we can develop a provably stable method based off of these kinds of variables. So there's an additional complication here that we'll be addressing later in the year. Um, and where we're going to start today is not even doing 3D. We've got a long way to go before we can be confident in the steps we're going to take to get to 3D. So what we're going to start with today is the following. Let me see if I got another slide here. Get that background change because that white is really bright. There we go. What we're going to start with today, we're going to do 2D compressible oiler. Okay, we're going to start in conservative form. I'm not going to implement no gravity, so we're not going to do gravity yet. We're going to do a linear equation of state with um, density, energy, and salinity, okay? And uh, what else uh, can we do here? Uh, I think this is gonna give us a healthy chunk to bite off. The ultimate problem we wanna get to, right, is that some, uh, you know, after this, this slide is if I can add gravity, what we want to do is a very simple static fluid calculation where you initialize with like a uniform density salinity and we let the fluid adjust to give to give to allow the fluid to compress itself under its own weight. Um, so we can verify that we're getting what's called the correct adiabatic lapse rate. So this tells us, you know, how the density should increase as a function of depth along uh, or sorry, across uh, the potential surfaces, so the, across the gravitational potential surfaces. Um, so we have some way of validating whether or not we have a good steady state. You know, in the future, the other thing we need to do, if we were to follow what, what's being done in Andrew Winter's paper in 2021, is add correction terms to our flux formulations. Let me go back. One more slide. There we are. What we need to actually do is modify how we're calculating the, the uh, flux term where what we're going to average is the uh, essentially the conservative form and the advective form of the equations um, so that we get a provably stable um, system. Uh, so this, again, there's a lot to do here. Um, so what I'm going to go ahead and do though is get started in the code and the point of the coding session is to help you see how you can start from the um, templates that are provided in the Spectra Element Library in Fortran uh, to, to create your own conservation law solvers. I'd like to show you how we can also get some of these implemented on the GPU side. So we'll start tackling how to implement those models, how to integrate it into the make system, um, and then we'll do a gist of a very basic example uh, to get things started. So we're going to go ahead and hop over. Uh, to the computer here, so let me switch screens. All right. So with all that being said, uh, we're going to go ahead and start creating our 2D compressible Euler solver. Okay. So if you're not familiar with self, um, there's, it looks like I still have some output here from a previous episode. Um, there's a few directories you should be aware of. We have a, uh, this directory called CI, which is used for all of our uh, automated testing. So you don't need to worry about that. There's some, uh, you don't need to worry about that today. Uh, but certainly if you issue a pull, pull request, there's some steps that get executed in there uh, that, that make sure that what you're integrating in is gonna keep things working and we check out whether or not you got sufficient tests, et cetera. 
Um, Self does build Docker containers and also during our build process we create singularity images from those uh, after they're tested, which is nice. Um, the directories where we're working in today are the examples directory. So once we get the new model implemented, we'll hop in there and write up a sample program to add to our testing suite. And the source directory, which is where all the source code for um, the library is organized. Now the source code itself is just a collection of Fortran modules. Those modules define um, specific data types for working with um, CPU and GPU data, one. So that's gonna be our self memory class. So just a, uh, a class that gives you access to Fortran multi-dimensional arrays and C pointers so that you can allocate memory and work with memory on a GPU. We have classes for dealing with Lagrange interpolating polynomials. This is the workhorse of the whole system and it gives you the ability to do interpolation and differentiation operations, which when you piece that together uh, with a mesh and geometry, we can create uh, mapped derivatives so you can calculate uh, gradient divergence curl in mapped coordinate systems for quadrilateral and hexahedra. Um, we have ways of organizing data. So we have self data, which is just the base class for um, uh, in working with scalars. So mathematical scalars, mathematical vectors, mathematical tensors, and the way they're implemented is multidimensional arrays in Fortran. And then the map data, it combines geometry mesh information with the data classes to give you nice and easy to use procedures to do divergence gradient curl in uh, mapped coordinates. From the map data class, we can actually start to create more sophisticated models. And that's what's the model class here. The model class provides uh, a lot of the framework you need to forward step a model with an explicit time stepper. So we currently don't have support for implicit time steppers, but I'm working on a strategy uh, to get that implemented. But the way this stitches together um, is we have Fortran abstract classes. At the very bottom, we have a generic model, which has some things that all models are supposed to inherit in, in the self class. And then we use what are called deferred procedures to um, leverage the compiler to warn the user or to error out on the user uh, that they need to define these methods. Some methods I can pre-code like I always know the workflow for forward stepping a nodal DGSEM method, but the specifics of how you calculate a flux, for example, are left up to you. So we use these deferred methods um, to sketch out what needs to be defined in a, in a concretized model. Um, and of course, if you don't define them when you define your own model, the compiler will error out on you and, and direct you to go back and do that. So we try to use that as a way to sort of set up bumpers uh, to keep you keep you on track with with implementing a model that in a way that we recommend. Um, so on top of that model class, we do have models for 1D, 2D, and 3D, and these provide a lot of the basic uh, data structures you might need. So of course, you have a solution. If you're doing things that involve diffusion processes, you usually need a solution gradient. Um, when you're using split form methods, you usually need to keep track of a velocity field of some sort so that you can do an averaging of the conservative form and the advective form uh, to get you a split form method. So we have that field there for you. There's a flex field source. And then of course there are work, uh, what I would call like workhorse arrays where um, we're using these tables to um, kind of track the individual calculations we need to do as we forward step the model. So when you go to define your specific model and today when we define compressible Euler in 2D, we're gonna do a type extension on one of these. So if you're doing here, since we're doing 2D, what we're gonna do is a type extension on top of model 2D. Now there are included with self some specific models that we have implemented. So you can see I've got advection. We've got a Burgers equation solver in 1D. Um, there's shallow water 1D, shallow water, this is in 2D. Uh, we got linear shallow water, but the idea today is we're going to basically kind of duplicate what's going on in these, doing a type extension off of model 2D uh, to create a compressible oil solver. So you can either, I like to cheat, it's always good to cheat when you can, and when it's, when it's ethical to do so. 
Um, <laughs> what we're going to do is pick one of these existing 2D models. We're going to copy it over and we're just going to modify that. It's usually a good place to get started because, uh, you know, otherwise it can be, you know, of course, it's a little bit more work to get off the ground. But if you, let's go back real quick into that self model class. Um, the deal is what we have uh, to define, what our job is to define, if you remember from the um, uh, the, the sort of the depiction in the blackboarding session is we need to define that flux vector, we need to define the source terms, we need to define the Riemann solver. So that's essentially what we need to specify today to concretize your model. So let's start by copying self shallow water. We'll copy that to Euler 2D. Because I will be following up in a few weeks here doing a 3D version once we get comfortable with the 2D version. Nice thing about the 2D problems, for the most part, we can fit them on a single GPU and get results back fairly quickly so we can build some comfortability um, with this solver. All right, so first thing I'm gonna do is swap out shallow water for Euler. And we're gonna go through the top here. What I love about Fortran is when you're doing these uh, derived types, it, in some sense, it, I wouldn't say it's complete documentation, but it's some, in some sense, uh, giving you like a table of contents of what to expect in this module. So we have a type. We're going to define some specific parameters here. I'm not going to use the uh, Coriolis. Um, oh, I know what's going on. Let me get up another tab here. There we go. I'm not going to use Coriolis parameter. We're not going to use gravity. We're not going to use bottom topography or that. Um, but, uh, so yeah, what we have is the type. The type's gonna tell us what's, what sort of things we need to track. Now, of course, since we're doing a type extension in Fortran, we inherit all of the properties of the Model 2D class. So unless I need anything additional, we're not gonna bother with this. Of course, at some point, we'll, we'll need like to put in the uh, potential term, et cetera, for gravity. Um, now, since I'm not adding additional parameters yet, to this model, I don't need to override the initializer. So we'll just inherit the initializer we get from the model 2D class. So I'll actually go ahead and get rid of that line. I don't have derived quite yet the mathematical entropy that we can use to track stability. If you define an entropy and you and you set this method, calculate entropy, during the time stepping process, the, the, um, the inherited method that uh, forward steps the model will automatically call this method and report the entropy to screen. So it's, it's a great way to just track uh, model stability over time. We don't have it yet, so we're also not going to worry about that today. We have no pretendency to worry about today, so we'll kill those out. And these are the methods that we're going to concretize. Source, flux, Riemann solver, and boundary conditions. So I didn't really talk too much about the boundary conditions today. Uh, but we essentially have two forms that we'll work with. One is no normal flow. Um, you can imagine what that does, right? You're just not going to let flow permeate through that boundary. Um, essentially, that comes down to setting the normal velocity uh, to zero, and the tangential velocity will use a free slip uh, boundary condition there. So the tangential velocity ends up being preserved across a, a side. In that case, the pressure, um, total energy, and the um, salinity, density weighted salinity, so the density as well, uh, will be held constant over the sidewalls. The other one is a radiation boundary condition. Radiation boundary condition essentially implies that when we're doing that Riemann solver, the interior state where we're actually modeling is whatever the interior state is, but the external state is gonna be a quiescent fluid. So it'll just be no velocity, a reference uh, energy field, and um, reference density, reference pressure, etc. So that'll be that. Uh, we don't need to add any new methods. Shallow water equations, we did need to add topography. Um, and I'll talk about these interface blocks here when, uh, when we're done implementing the CPU side and make, we, you know, we're certain that it compiles. These interface blocks, in short, are used uh, to bind uh, C++ kernels uh, that are used to launch uh, GPU kernels. Um, you can use these interface blocks with ISOC binding in Fortran. So you're doing mixed language programming so that you can launch kernels on the GPU. 
We're not going to do that quite yet. We're going to get the CPU side working and then we'll touch base there. So again, I'm going to go ahead and kill this initializer. We don't need it. We're going to inherit the initializer from uh, the model 2D class. Again, we're not going to do entropy calculation yet because we don't have that defined. And we don't need a pretendency method. That pretendency method, if, if in case you're wondering, in the shallow water solver was just used to calculate the velocity. Uh, so we can do a split form method with the shallow water solver. So if you are doing split form and you need to diagnose a velocity field, definitely you can use that pretendency um, routine to, to get that in place. Don't need to set topography. We'll kill that. All right, so let's do our boundary equation. Boundary condition. So if we have radiation, all right, so let's define the order in which we're going to define variables here. So, you know, I probably do want to put that initializer in there because for the Euler equations, we have a fixed number of variables. So let's, let's kind of go over this. What we're going to do for the first one, we'll do it in the same order I put it in the, um, uh, actually, you know what? I'm going to do momentum first. We'll do rho times u. So x momentum. This is just for me to remember what we're doing here. So I have y momentum. Okay, and then we'll do rho, not p, rho. Rho. So this is just going to be rho, so this will be density. We'll do uh, rho times e, so total energy. And then we'll do uh, rho times S, so salinity. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and pull that uh, initializer back in because, um, all right, let's go to init. Let's copy this guy. So go, let's see, from 96 down to 147. I, yeah, I suppose there's other good reasons to do this. Um, I'll kind of go over this in a second. Um, so 96 to 147. It's going to give us 51 lines. I don't know if my uh, Vim memory is sufficient. Oh, it looks like I did it. Okay. Ah, didn't grab the, the last line. Okay. So a couple things here. So let's swap that out again for... Oof, shouldn't have done that. Just leave it at Euler. I'll fix the number of dimensions later. All right, so the deal is um, the model class really, it normally accepts any number of variables coming in. It's kind of a clunky way of handling this, but um, what we need to have, so whenever you do a type extension, if you override a particular procedure, you need to preserve the API so the argument ordering, number of arguments, et cetera, it needs to be exactly the same as the, the parent or the procedure that's being overridden. So we have to include it, although we know in 2D we have density, um, we have two components of velocity, so that's three variables so far. We have, um, oh, what else? <laughs> Salinity and total energy, so that's six variables, or sorry, five variables and then plus the pressure, so six variables. Which reminds me, I actually do need to put in pressure here. So I lied when I said I did not need an additional term here. So if you're looking for the class, so there's a self-mapped data class that can be used um, to store data. And underneath the hood, it has everything you need to keep things on the CPU, GPU. It provides methods to, to do data copies back and forth, etc. Let me go to the model 2D. If you just look at the solution uh, term there, we just need a map scalar. So we're going to take a map scalar in 2D and we're going to call that pressure. So we do need that. And we will need a way to calculate pressure. So we will need to add our own equation of state method. Um, okay, so what we have is five prognostic variables. So I need to set the number of variables to five. We're going to get rid of G and the Coriolis. We're going to use a conservative flux term. 
Um, let's see what else. I don't need, so I need solution, I need pressure. I don't need the gradient. Now the way the ordering works here in the initializer is you need to pass in when you're creating a map data uh, variable, you need to give it a geometry object, or, or sorry, an interpolant object. Um, ideally, the interpolant object it matches what you're using for the geometry. In other words, we're doing isoparametric spectral element methods. So that's what I'm passing in here. What this does is underneath the hood, there's a pointer, a Fortran pointer to that particular interpolant. So that interpolant, uh, or sorry, this, this data is always associated with that particular interpolant. So. Uh, the number of variables for that thing we're allocating. So underneath the hood, the data ordering uh, for the interior points, uh, we, we on the outermost uh, array index, it's the element. So this, the element in the mesh, then you have the number of uh, variables. So if you wanna stack multiple variables in the same map data class, you can do that. And then we have the quadrature points. Um, as the, 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 the dimensions that vary the fastest. So um, I'm gonna hang on to all these other components. Let me make sure WorkSol is part of that. Yeah, it is. Um, I'm gonna keep all these other components here. Now what we can do, so this is something that the, the, the initializer from the Model 2D class doesn't do, but we can actually set the name, the units, and the description for each of the fields so that when the HDF5 files are written by self, which is again another method that's inherited for free, you actually have metadata associated with those. So it makes it a little bit more I don't know, nice to work with um, when, you're, when you're trying to, to read the data in say another program for post-processing, et cetera. Um, so remember we have these. So I wanna go ahead and copy this down below. And we'll just go ahead and set the name, units, and description for the variables we're working with. Okay, oops. So the first one will have row times u. Um, units, I suppose, at some point could be configurable. We're gonna fix the units we're working with. So for density, it'll be kilogram per meter cubed. If you multiply that by meters per second, what you end up with is meter squared per second on the bottom. Okay. Um, let's say this is going to be X component of the momentum. Um, and this is per unit mass or per unit volume, momentum per unit volume, because it's a density weighted, not a mass weighted, uh, uh velocity. So we'll copy that. We'll do the same thing for V. So now I'm going to increment the variable that we're working with to the second one, so this will be row V, this will be Y component. Let's do the third one. We said is density. So this is kilogram per meter cubed. Okay, fluid density, Ooh, let's make sure we get that to number three. Then we have row times energy. So that's kilogram per meter cubed um, multiplied by, oh boy, because the internal, I might, I might need to rethink what I wrote there, but we should end up with kilogram per meter cubed and there should be a meter squared per second squared in there. So this should end up being meters per second squared. I'll make sure I get that fixed in my notes. I might have been a little sloppy there. Um, but anyways, we have the density weighted total energy. What I like about actually planning out what I'm doing and writing it down and then trying to put it in code, you can catch mistakes uh, before you even think about merging things into your code. So pays pays to be a little careful. And thank you for being here to motivate me to do this. So uh, we also have rho times s. So we have the salinity here, and salinity is actually unitless. It's the fraction of water that is not fresh. Um, so the units here are kilogram per meter cubed, and then we usually say, um, you know, grams per grams or kilogram per kilogram. 
um, as, as the units. So this is the kilograms of salt divided by the, kil the total mass of the water. So salt component plus the fresh component. Um, but we'll, call it, we'll just call it density weighted salinity per unit volume. I guess if I really wanted to be, right, if I really want to be proper, uh, this is per unit volume, there too. Uh, so this one, I need to make sure I change it over to five. Now, of course, by default, the, the HDF5 and tech plot output's not gonna give us a pressure. And this brings me back to my point I was making about having a mapping between prognostic and diagnostic variables. Once we have all those bits in place, we can do an oper uh, a, a, root, a subroutine override when we're ready uh, to override the HDF5 IO to add some of these new variables, the diagnostic variables we wanna have to our output. Um, again, because that can be helpful to have that in like the standard visualization uh, for, for the code. So that is the initialization. We've gotten that taken care of. So now we have a pressure variable to work with. Um, let's go ahead and talk about how to do the boundary conditions. So what we're going to do uh, for boundary conditions, these are what are called edge or face operations in self. So you have two types. You have internal. And by internal, what I mean there is operations that take place on the internal quadrature points for every element. Now, face or edge operations are operations that take place, of course, on the faces or edges of the elements. And the, the ideal loop ordering for these edge or face operations is to loop over elements. It's always our outermost uh, array index. Then we loop over the sides of each element. In 2D, you have four sides for a quadrilateral. And then we loop over the quadrature points on that side. So you can think about what, what you're doing on that side is uh, there are interpolation points where those Lagrange interpolating polynomials uh, are evaluated. And we're looping over uh, each of those quadrature points on that edge. Now when you're on that edge, um, the mesh provides a, a lookup table called side info. Um, the, the schema for that is documented in the self mesh class at the top. It's also in our documentation, uh, but the fifth uh, index for that element for that side is the boundary condition ID. And the third index there is the neighboring element. Now, when, a, uh, when you have an interior uh, element, so an element that's well inside of your, 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 um, your mesh or an interior side for that matter, there are two elements on either side of that, that side. Now for a boundary element, you'll only have one element associated with it. So the secondary neighboring element, so what I have is E2 here, uh, will come back as zero. Uh, so that's, you know, a secondary element being zero is one way to immediately detect if you're on a physical boundary. The other thing you want to do is pull that boundary condition ID so that uh, you can, uh, you know, toggle between uh, different boundary conditions that might be provided by your mesh. So I've got some built-in uh, intrinsics that can be used. Um, and so long as you set up a way to map from a string or however you're, or, or if your mesh generator outputs a boundary condition ID as an integer, um, as long as you have a mapping to some way to identify that in the code, you can do that sort of uh, boundary condition selection. So we'll do radiation first. So what we need is U and V we'll set to zero, which is nice. Um, See, we have density. What we'll do for density, ooh, that's a tough one. Um, we do need to have some kind of uh, reference density. Hmm. So I think what I'll, I'm gonna do this for now. I don't think it's stable, but I'm gonna put something in here for the moment. What we're gonna fill in, so you'll notice that we have, uh, if you're not familiar with Fortran syntax for working with um, user-defined data types, the percent symbol is used to access an attribute of that data type. So when I'm stacking these uh, percent symbols, what I'm looking at is, so this is our Euler model. That Euler model has a solution. That solution has a lot of attributes, one of them being the external boundary. Um, so for that given element, it's telling me what the value is of the external state relative to that particular element. Then we have either host data or device data, host data being CPU side data. 
What we're going to do is set the solution external boundary to the internal solution at that boundary. So we're just going to prolong the density field. Again, I don't think that's stable, but I just, I'm going to put something in there for now uh, to, to kick things off. I think at some point what I might do is, is just have a static solution that we can prescribe as a background state that we can uh, use as our reference for uh, boundary conditions or even uh, doing, a, I guess, like adjustment models off of a off of a background state. I don't know. Anyways, that's a problem for another day. We're just going to try to get this going. Uh, so next next up we have after density, we have the total energy, which again, I think what I'll do here. Um, oh boy, because this is going to involve the internal energy and the um, so yeah, this will involve the internal energy, a n zero kinetic energy, and that'll be it. So I do need to have a reference. Yeah, I'm gonna have to have a reference field. So you know what, I'm not gonna do the, the radiation boundary condition quite yet until I get a reference field set in. It's nice to think about these things sort of as we go. Um, so I'm only gonna set uh, no normal flow. So we're going to get the boundary normal vector. We'll get U and V. If you've seen previous videos, I walk through how you can can apply basically free slip boundary conditions and no normal flow to get what U and V, the X and Y components need to be. Again, we're going to prolong the density. We'll prolong the energy here because you know the external uh, kinetic energy that we're specifying might not be zero, but what it ends up working out to at least for no normal flow is prolongation of the internal uh, energy or the total energy. And then we'll do the same thing for the salinity. So no, no gradient in either of those, in, in, in any of these last three fields. And then here for one and two, so the X and Y components of the momentum, no normal flow, free slip, boundary condition. Okay, so that's there. It's nice as you go through this to figure out what it is you're, you're missing in your design. Uh, sometimes that is just part of the part of the process. So again, we're not going to do any source terms today. So what we'll do is just go ahead and um, we'll make this nice. We'll do I var is uh, one to this percent n var uh, solution percent uh, source. Let's do source percent n var just for consistency. Okay, bump this over. Okay, so make that I var, and we'll set that to, uh, to zero. So no source terms today. Eventually we'll add in the uh, geopotential gradient. Uh, then we'll add in Coriolis. We'll add in all the bells and whistles at some point. So let's do our flux term. Now the flux, much like the source term, is a, is a volume loop. Um, I'm missing an element loop here, so let's get that back in. <laughs> Uh, so the uh, flux and the source term are volume loops. So what this means is we're looping over the internal quadrature points for the elements. So we have the element loop on the outer. Um, boy, I am messing up all sorts of things today. We have the uh, element loop, then the variable loop, and then the two dimensions for the quadrature within each element. Um, and what this ordering does is it gives us contiguous memory access on, on the volume arrays for your solution. So these interior components uh, for the source term, for the solution, the flux, etc. cetera, um, that loop ordering, again, gets you contiguous memory access, which is favorable. Um, we're going to do the same kind of thing. So we've got our volume, our, our tightly nested volume loops, elements, variables, quadrature points. Uh, for the first term, what we need is, um, so we have hu squared, or rho u times u. Might be in our benefit here to actually calculate velocity. So we'll probably implement, bring back that free tendency term. Um, uh, rho times u times v. So the thing we're advecting multiplied by the velocity field, then we have plus P. Uh, actually, so this is the X component here, so we just need P. 
there. This next one is going to be row UV. And that'll be it. So what we're doing here is uh, we're doing the first variable, which again is the x component, the momentum. There's since the flux is a vector, we need to set the x and y components of that vector. So we have the first component is x, second component is y. So we'll get, yeah, it looks like from the shallow water I had pulled u, so we can actually just reuse that from the velocity field. We'll bring back that pre-tendency calculation here in a second. Got uh, the velocity multiplied by rho times u. So we got the solution. Uh, then what we need to do is add the pressure. So what we'll do is pressure. So let's say this pressure, interior, host data, loop over the quadrature points, then the variable, so the number of variables for pressure is just one, so we'll just grab the first one, and then IL. So the next term, we're gonna grab the V component, so the V velocity, the Y component of the velocity, multiplied by rho times U. Okay. So it's nice because the shallow water Equations at least have a similar form for the evective terms in terms of how they're implemented so we can rehash that. So here again we'll do uh, rho times u times, uh, sorry, rho times v times u. So we're vecting rho v with the u component of the velocity. So this is the x component of the y momentum equation. So this is uh, rho times v, that's u. Here what we want to have is rho times v times v plus pressure. Okay, so we got v, this is rho times v. Then we just want to grab that pressure. Let's do that. That's looking pretty good. All right, so here we have uh, density. And density pl it, it plays a similar role in the shallow water equations that the fluid thickness did. So we can basically reuse this. We have rho times u for the x component of the uh, density advection. And then we have the y component of the density advection is uh, just rho times v. Okay, so now we've got our uh, fourth uh, equation and then our fifth equation that we need to add. So let's go ahead and bring those down. Uh, so the fourth equation is the um, total energy. And remember that was rho times u vector times uh, dynamic enthalpy. And the dynamic enthalpy um, is just going to be the total energy plus pressure over density. So we'll need to calculate enthalpy. Um, might be good to add that as a variable and we can just add that to our pre-tendency calculations could be good. So I'll keep that in mind as we're doing that. that, that what, that's what we'll likely do. Let me copy these. Um, yes. Sorry. Had a couple things going through my mind here. All right. So um, again, we're looking at the X component of the flux for the fourth variable, which is total energy. So we need rho times u times enthalpy. Um, so what we're going to do is I'm going to assume that I'm going to add this uh, enthalpy variable. And then we'll, we'll add a pre-tendency calculator um, to diagnose the uh, enthalpy. Uh, ass assuming that we have total energy and uh, pressure. So that's likely going to have to get rolled into the equation of state somewhere. So we'll sketch that out here in a minute. Um, and then for the y component, it's just going to be the same kind of thing. So except it's going to be rho v times the uh, dynamic enthalpy. So let's do that line continuator continuation. And there we go. I think we're looking good there. So we got the enthalpy multiplied by rho v, and then we can do the same kind of thing for the salinity. It just kind of gets vectored around as well. Of course, we're not using um, the enthalpy here. So we'll do three, four, five, six. Copy those six lines, place it down here, and here we're doing density weighted uh, salinity. Okay. So again, we'll get rho u times s. 
So instead of enthalpy here, what I need is the, um, so what I, I guess there's a lot of ways we could do this. I could use rho u, multiply by rho s, divide by rho, that's one way to do it. I could do velocity field times s. I think that's the way I'm gonna go. Um, so actually, I think if I recall correctly, this is what works out to be what we need to do for the split form method, so we'll stick with this. So we'll do velocity, uh, first component there, and then we have the solution. Uh, what we need is the um, yeah, we need the density weighted salinity here. So that's what we'll do there. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay, so we're going to grab the velocity. So we'll grab the second component of the velocity since we're now doing V, and that should be good. So a couple things we need to do. Um, I've realized after now defining the fluxes, we need to add an enthalpy diagnostic. So let's go back down to our pressure. Um, a couple things we'll need to do. We'll go back to the shallow water class. Let's get our pre-tendency. So 190 down to 239, so that's 49. Okay, so the first thing we do here, we calculate the um, uh, velocity. So let's, what we need to do to do that is basically divide the momentum by the density. The dividing the momentum by density gives us velocity. So I'm gonna send a substitute out just for clarity. <laughs> rho for H, or H for rho. Okay, so we have that. We've divided out, so we got our velocity field. That's great, now we need enthalpy. So I'm gonna go back up into this first loop here. Um, what we need for enthalpy is um, total energy plus the pressure. So I've got uh, enthalpy. Interior, post data. Uh, IJ1IL is, um, we got is the energy. Let's see here. So if I got the energy for, so that's uh, rho U, rho V, rho, rho E, so that's number four. So that gives me density weighted. Um, interesting. So what I could do is add the pressure. I could do a density weighted enthalpy. Um, is that what the equations demand? Let's see. We've got rho. Hmm. I could do a density weighted enthalpy and then just use the velocity down below. I think that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so. We'll go and pull the pressure. Here, so we'll do density weighted uh, energy plus the pressure. Okay, and if I go back down to that flux system, what I need to have is the velocity times the density weighted enthalpy. So that what's actually in that enthalpy variable is density weighted enthalpy. That 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 I can live with. All right, now the trick here is that in pre-tendency we don't have the pressure yet. 
we need to diagnose the pressure. So what we need to do is essentially set up a method for the equation of state. And what the equation of state should do for us is take in the salinity, energy, and pressure and uh, calculate a, um, uh, sorry, salinity, energy, and density and calculate a pressure. So this is to do. So we'll need to do that in order to get things right. All right, so we've got our enthalpy. Let's do the same kind of thing down here. So what we are doing up here is the uh, evaluation of velocity at the interior points of all the uh, elements. And now what we need to do is the boundary um, evaluation. This actually is not a, we don't necessarily want to do this because if we're using Gauss quadrature, this actually incurs an, an aliasing error. If we're using gauss lobato quadrature, it doesn't. So it's not um, necessarily the best way to handle this. What we ought to be doing down here instead, I should fix this in the shallow water solver, is uh, do a boundary interp. So we can call boundary interp, which is an intrinsic for that map data class to uh, interpolate the thing we've just calculated to the boundaries. Then we do a side exchange, and the side exchange is what handles all the MPI communication, so you don't have to worry about doing that. You can just call that side exchange anytime you need uh, other neighboring ranks to be aware of, of those values. Um, so we'll take care of that. We'll do velocity, we'll do uh, enthalpy. Okay, and then we need to do. Uh, of course, we'll do pressure because we're the pre tendency is going to take care of all three of these for us. I don't know why I didn't just do a search and replace. Uh, okay, so that's the deal there. And just for the sake of tidiness, we'll calculate pressure from the equation of state, calculate velocity, calculate enthalpy once we have those. Uh, and then we'll do boundary interpolation and then side exchange. Um, so that one, that information is now available on the sidewalls of each element, and then it's also available on neighboring uh, MPI ranks. So that's cool. That works out there. That'll be our pretendency method. Let's go ahead and add that definition up top. So we'll grab those four from the shallow water, drop it in, and swap out shallow water for Euler. Yeah, we're not doing the entropy calculation yet. Okay. Uh, we need to do a Riemann solver. So again, we're doing local lax Friedrichs. Um, boy, I, I suppose there's a few things we might want to add here, but let's kind of go through this one by one. So we get the boundary normal. We calculate the normal velocity at the cell edges. And we need to calculate the max eigenvalue. In order to get the max eigenvalue, we need to know the speed of sound. Um, so we're also going to end up needing um, sound speed as a diagnosed variable. That would help. Um, and we'll add that to our list of things to do here. So I'm likely not going to get all of this done today, but again, the point of this exercise here is to show you how you would implement your own conservation loss solver. Speed of sound. Is that what I called it? Yes. Oh no, I call it sound speed. Of course I did. Um, so we'll do that. Let's go to that pre-tendency. Pre-tendency, we're going to go ahead and rack up a couple more things here. We'll add a method to calculate sound speed, and then we'll also do right similar thing. Prolong it to the boundaries, interpolate. So what I can do then, um, we'll keep CLCR to indicate the sound speed. What we'll do is we'll grab. We don't need the square root anymore. So what we need is the first variable. Um, 
we don't need solution. What we need here is sound speed. Okay, so I've got my boundary normal velocity from the left and the right. I've got my sound speed from the left and right. Don't need these guys, which is good. And so now we can just basically do the average of what we're going to do is average the fluxes and then multiply by the jump in uh, or add the max eigenvalue multiplied by the jump in the solution. So let's do the left fluxes first. So we've got, um, let's see here. Oh, maybe I do want those back. That would, now nah, let's, eh, let's just be a little bit verbose here. So we have, um, so what we need is the advective velocity. So we have UNL multiplied by the solution um, boundary. And we want the host data. And what we want is the ith quadrature point, the first variable, i side side, i l element. Okay, so that's the advective component. Let's do the pressure term. So this will be this pressure boundary host data i1 i side i l. Okay, so this gives us again the normal velocity multiplied by the momentum, the x momentum plus the pressure dotted with the um, x component of the boundary normal. So I'm going to duplicate that and we'll do the, oops. We'll do that for the second term. So here we have the y component of the momentum, we have the pressure, and we have the y component of the boundary normal. Um, then for the density, we have no pressure term. It's either just the advective components. Uh, we have UNL multiplied by the density. Cool. These next few are easy, I think. And we'll, I'll fill those in here in a minute. All right, so we have density. Let's do the, sol uh, this is gonna be the total energy. So we have UNL and then we have enthalpy here. Okay. And then for the salinity, we have UNL Oops, this is going to be number five. So the fifth flex vector component um, will have the solution. So we have, we want the density weighted salinity multiplied by the boundary normal velocity. Okay. Let's copy this. And then uh, since we're going to be looking at the external state for flux R, we can just change the word boundary for EXT boundary to get us the external boundary flux. So eight lines to copy there, paste them down below. Let's change flux L to flux R. And we're gonna change boundary to EXT boundary. Great. So again, we're just taking the, the, the flux from either side um, of the element uh, to do our momentum uh, mass, energy, and salinity exchanges. Now we need to calculate the maximum eigenvalue from either side. And again, remember that's the normal velocity plus or minus the speed of sound, uh, absolute value. So we'll look at the um, max out of those four quantities using both the left and right states. And then we can reconstruct the actual boundary normal flux. So again, that's going to be the average of the um, of the fluxes plus the max absolute value, uh, sorry, the absolute max eigenvalue multiplied by the jump in the solution. And then because this ends up getting stitched together in a, um, a length integral, we need to multiply by the boundary normal magnitude, which we pulled out higher up in the code. Okay, so let's get this uh, solution jump squared away here. What I can do for the solution jump is uh, one through five and this again because this does a little bit of data striding here it's not ideal but because of the work on the boundaries scales uh, like one over n in comparison to the interior this is actually a fairly light lightweight routine um, so anyway 
We're going to do the jump here is going to be the solution uh, at the, so the internal state I um, one through five, I side, I L. Whoops. Yeah, I'll keep that in there. That's fine. We're going to subtract off the external state to get us the solution jump. Okay. So let's do a minus line continuation and then we'll do EXT boundary here. So what we're doing is again, calculating the jump across uh, the element face and we'll stick that in this equation here. And what I can do to simplify this a little bit in terms of how it looks, we can use the array syntax in Fortran to condense all this down neatly, okay? So that's what it looks like for the uh, local Lax Friedrichs Riemann solver. We've hit the bottom here. So let's um, keep in mind that if we were to run this now, because there's some methods we haven't defined, this would give us nonsense answers. It's not complete, but it, this is the start. Let's uh, now talk about how to add this to our make system for self. So if you're contributing a new model to this library, uh, the next step from here, if you go into the uh, uh, root of the repository. There's a few make files. We have a the the head make files called make file. Then there's a few uh, files that are rolled in as part of that make system. So we have the compiler specifications, dependency flags, um, and then we have this make dot include, which has some of the definitions about the things we want to compile. So that's the one we're going to edit. So we go into make.include, what you want to add are the uh, F to the F90 sources. So what we're going to do is add self Euler to D. You don't need to put the extension. In a minute here, when we go to add the GPU kernel, uh, we will come down to the CPP sources and add self Euler to D. And then when we go to add an example to test out our module, we would add that down here. So for now, we're just going to do this. Um, there's a few ways to, to make the um, application, you can either use SPAC, a package manager on your local system, uh, to set up the environment, which uh, we've included under the env directory. There's a SPAC environment file. Let's take a look at that. Okay, this defines a specification for um, the uh, libraries that self depends on. Now, in addition to these, uh, they're called specs in SPAC, HIP4, HDF5, JSON, Fortran, FEQ, Parse, and Flap. In addition to those, on your, on your system, you need to have installed outside of those, these packages, CUDA, um, preferably 11.2.0, and HIP, which comes with Rockham. So if you're on Ubuntu or um, CentOS, this is pretty easy to install. Um, just a couple steps to get that set up. And it assumes that CUDA is installed in user local CUDA and, and HIP is installed under Operacom. You could do that. Um, it's a little bit more challenging. The other way we recommend is underneath the CI directory, there is a cloud build pipeline for building locally on your system. All it requires is that you have the G Cloud SDK installed and uh, you have uh, Docker installed. And this will go through a process, not of just building a Docker container, uh, but it will run through a very simple test and provide you some code coverage reports. That's what we're going to do. Let me see if I've got that set up. Uh, so we got cloud build local dry run. Yep, that looks good. So we'll pass that config um, CI cloud build local.yaml and then indicate we're going to build from the current directory. So we'll let that run. While that's building, I, I'll hop into another window here and give you a gist of how to do the GPU uh, programming. Uh, you know I've still got a to-do list of things to do here, but I kind of want to give you the gist of how this works. So underneath the source um, uh, directory in the repository, there's a HIP subdirectory. Under the HIP subdirectory, there are C++ files. Those C++ files contain, uh, for every method that you want to offload on the GPU, two methods. One's called a wrapper, and one is the actual HIP kernel that has the GPU uh, source code. I, I'll give you a gist of what this looks like for shallow water. We won't actually do the implementation today for Euler. 
So it is the end of the week. I'm tired, and uh, tomorrow we've got National Reading Day, so a little bit of reading to catch up on. Um, so let's take a look here. So in the shallow water, ex for example, uh, what we have are, um, again, like I said, the hip kernels. So the hip kernels are designated by this global specifier. If you've written CUDA before, these are uh, identical to writing a CUDA kernel. Um, but we'll, we'll set up uh, you know, the API, what comes in and out uh, for this method. And then we have the uh, C++ code for executing on the GPU. Now, the way you do array indexing on the GPU is you don't necessarily have to do for loops. You can actually use GPU thread IDs uh, to do your array accessing so that all the operations can be done in parallel. So you usually see at the top I've got um, the uh, quadrature, uh, the element IDs, the side IDs, for example, in this case for setting boundary conditions, set to block IDs, so for the element inside, so things that are um, non-contiguous in memory we'll do with blocks, and then things that are contiguous in memory, like the quadrature points, we do with the local thread IDs. Um, that's, so that's the hip kernel. Uh, now, to expose that hip kernel to, the, to Fortran, what you really need to do is define a, uh, it's called an extern C function. Um, the reason why we put that specifier there is so that when the compiler comes through and compiles this, the name doesn't get, the name of that object in the library doesn't get mangled. Um, so we can actually reference it from ISOC binding. So you enclose this wrapper method, and all that wrapper method is really doing is using uh, this hip syntax, which looks, it's again, it's identical to the CUDA syntax to launch the method. So it'll call that GPU kernel. It'll tell it how many, uh, it's what are called blocks. So these are uh, the number of groups of threads that we're gonna launch. Then we have the number of threads in a group. Uh, then you have the amount of shared memory per block and then stream ID, which a little bit more complicated things to talk about uh, there, but uh, eventually we'll be getting into doing asynchronous kernel launches in the code because, for example, we can calculate diffusive operations at the same time as doing advective operations. So we can really keep the GPU busy uh, with all the work we throw at it by using streams. That's a topic for another day. And then, of course, you guys, your, your arguments to go to that GPU kernel. So when we bind um, the GPU code to Fortran, what we're actually doing is exposing this wrapper method to the Fortran side. So let's take a look at that. So for the boundary condition, for example, for the shallow water. Uh, self shallow water. The way you do that is through an interface block on the Fortran side. Uh, so you see we now have a subroutine. It's set to, it has the same name as that C method that we had defined. It's not a requirement, but in self, it's, some, it's a convention that we use to keep things tidy. And at the, I know this is on a line continuation, um, but at the end of that subroutine specification, you can use this bind parameter uh, to actually tie that subroutine to that specific C object. So if you have ISO C binding included in the module, this is how you would tie up a C subroutine to be callable from Fortran, or a C method to be callable from Fortran as a subroutine. We'll define the interface. So this method takes in uh, C pointers, which again, you need to bring an ISOC binding to have that um, type available to you. And then we have uh, for our scalers that we pass through like the polynomial degree, the number of variables, number of elements, uh, you can use C ints for that. So that's the gist of how you do the GPU programming. Now in terms of calling that, um, you can see I've got it commented out at the moment because we're still working on integrating this into the shallow water solver. But essentially what you can do is use this GPU Excel uh, parameter that's uh, part of the model class to determine whether or not GPU acceleration has been enabled. Um, there's an API that the model class provides to detect if a GPU is available and if the user has requested uh, a GPU to turn that variable to true. Um, but you can essentially just call this like you would any other uh, subroutine. Just the important thing here to keep in mind is that instead of using host data like we've done before, for our CPU side method, you'll use the device data class. Let's take a look how our build did. Um, <laughs> looks like I messed up my make file here, so let's fix that. I used uh, spaces when I should have used should have been using tabs. Actually, no, it's just I just needed to put that 
find continuation there. Let's try that again. Um, so that, that's really the gist of it. Uh, where I'm going from here is, uh, you know, of course, any bugs that come up during the build process uh, will take care of fixing. Uh, once we can get this off the ground for the 2D solver, of course, I've got a few things to fix with the radiation boundary conditions, for example. Uh, we've got to do some sound speed calculations. We need to put the equation of state in there. Um, this is the direction things are going. We'll, we'll be uh, looking to expand this into modeling seawater with compressible uh, oiler, eventually adding in diffusive terms uh, using a Bassi rebay method for those diffusive fluxes. So thanks for tuning in, and I hope to see you next time.